So I think the first question I'd like to ask you is um, about the new civil war, a new cold war, if you will, yeah. right? That you have written about uh, focusing on Ukraine, maybe also a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, why do you think we should worry about the new cold war and how would you define it? Well, the, the United States, of course, since basically since Reagan has, has responded to the decline of its economic primacy and it's, it's really a ability to shape a consensual society in the West, with, which is also accepted by the rest of the world, uh, by uh, raising the level of violence in the, in the world. So uh, what the US has as one of its last assets is, is a, um, yeah, an incredible military apparatus that can, well, not really defeat uh, opponents, but can wreak havoc in, in many places. And that's just what they're doing. Um, the new Cold War is, is the response to um, uh, the unwillingness of uh, China and Russia to abide by American preferences. And, uh, well, Roy, for instance, said that uh, there's not much difference between the capitalism of Russia and uh, the West, but I think there's an enormous difference. And that became clear when uh, Putin began, uh, began uh, renationalizing uh, key economic assets and uh, when he locked up or had locked up uh, Khodorkovsky. Uh, that, that really drew the line under uh, the uh, Yeltsin era uh, when, when Russia abided by the preferences of the West. So w what happened after that was that the, um, uh, the, the level of tension, at initially about completely irrelevant cases like Pussy Riot for instance, which, which was a completely silly event, that would have been dealt uh, with harshly in Britain or in, in, in Italy, in Greece or wherever. And now it was dealt with harshly in uh, Russia and of course it became a cause celebre with Madonna and all the people rushing in. So that was long before the Crimea for anything that could really be, for, for which uh, Putin really could be faulted. And I, I think that, that if, if I can continue. Uh, uh, Putin is, uh, in, in Germany they call the people who are uh, soft on Russia in the current conjuncture, they call them Putin Versteher, the people who understand Putin. And I, I, I don't have a poster of Putin with the naked uh, torso over my bed, but I think he, you can compare him to a sort of Bismarck that is a power uh, player who operates from above, who, who will crush uh, serious opposition, like Bismarck did with the socialist laws, who has a tendency to go f to use force to, to get his way, but only when provoked. Uh, and who also, like Bismarck, Bismarck had uh, Bleichroeder as, as this private banker, and Bleichroeder made, just made sure that Bismarck's pension would not be uh, too meager. And I think uh, uh, Putin has a few oligarchs who, does, who do that for him, uh, like Rothenberg and, and mm -hmm. others. So it's not, a, it's not that we should dream of him as an ideal leader, but I think he's a very smart operator and uh, he outclasses easily any uh, leader from the West that has so far stood up to him. Um, and the new Cold War is simply because uh, yeah, it's, it's fed by the frustration that the West cannot come to grips with this man, cannot destabilize uh, the Russian government. And um, although I think that the popularity of Putin in Russia is superficial, uh, so it, it doesn't go very deep, uh, for the moment uh, the people will stand by him because they have a history in which major foreign invasions have failed to ultimately conquer Russia. And I think that's very, yeah, that, that's embedded in the national psyche, if you will. It's, it's actually not a national psyche because uh, Russia is a multinational federation. You know, mm -hmm. That's often forgotten, which they, ha they have their own uh, Islamic radical pro uh, problem, which they again have very much created mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. in the Caucasus region. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you this. So this rather <clears throat> simplistic picture that we hear in the liberal media of Western Europe, North America, presents this new Cold War as a clash between freedom and authoritarianism, between democracy and human rights on the one hand, and then some kind of totalitarianism on the other hand. You, on the other hand, seem to have a much more solid uh, economic analysis 
of how this represents uh, a conflict between particular strands of capitalism, perhaps. Uh, could you say a little bit more how we can read this new uh, Cold War as a particular juncture in the history of capitalism itself? Yeah. Well, you shouldn't forget that although uh, concepts like human rights are, of course, being used in a demagogic and propagandistic sense, they are not therefore meaningless. Human rights, ever since John Locke in the 17th century, meant that the right to property was associated with the right to free speech and the right to association, etc. If the West wants to advocate human rights in Russia, for instance, uh, they are uh, merely extending support to uh, the Russian bourgeoisie, who would be very receptive of this uh, support as well. So in that sense, it's not a meaningless uh, choice of, of propagandistic item. Um, but it's true that behind the clash between, and that, that will also limit uh, the possibilities of Trump, for instance, to depart from this uh, course, but behind the clash of uh, uh, Russia, of personalities, you know, Putin versus Obama or whatever, is um, the clash between two types of uh, capitalism. One is the um, oligopolistic, um, you know, radical uh, market doctrine, um, that I spoke about, uh, which is now run effectively by um, these uh, behind the scenes uh, passive uh, operators like um, BlackRock. Many people don't know that, for instance, the merger between um, uh, Monsanto and Bayer very much was the result of the fact that BlackRock is a majority uh, owner of one, Monsanto, and a major owner of the other, uh, Bayer. So that's a, that's a particular type of capitalism. The other type of capitalism is, a, is one that relies on the state in a different sense. Of course, they both rely on the state because that's what you have states for. But they rely on the state in the sense that um, the, there's no freedom of contract in the way there is in the West. So operators like BlackRock could not operate in the Russian or Chinese situation. There, the ultimate power resides in what I would call a state class. That is a class whose property and whose, whose power, social power, is actually anchored in its uh, control of the state. If it loses the state, then it also very soon uh, loses its control of social and economic assets. And that's, that explains why in non-Western states the issue of um, succession is always a problem. That's already the case in France. You know, the, the French system is, is very unstable in the sense of who, who passes power to, uh, to whom. You know, think, just think of the seizure of power by uh, de Gaulle. Uh, and that is because France emerged as a challenger or a contender state to uh, the liberal West, uh, where this problem was solved already in the early 18th century, uh, when two parties were formed, basically both, both committed to uh, private property and the whole Lockean program. And when the, uh, the concept of public opinion was discovered, uh, Jürgen Habermas wrote his dissertation about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, the change in the structure of public, mm -hmm. of the public sphere. And uh, that, that transformation <coughs> has not taken place uh, outside the English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, in the book by uh, Glenn Greenwald, um, there are the five eyes, and for many people that was a new concept. It's not a new concept for somebody who knows the, the Lockean antecedents of the English-speaking West, uh, because they've always been uh, part of a, a common cultural sphere and a common uh, sphere of, of yeah, free contract, um, etc. That doesn't exist uh, elsewhere. And when there are moments of um, penetration of that system into non-Western societies, as it did in Russia after uh, the collapse of communism and the, uh, the, in the Yeltsin years, then you can see that within those societies, very powerful forces begin to um, emerge 
who want to limit uh, the sort of free-floating uh, capitalist operator. So uh, the, the uh, locking up Khodorkovsky could count on a, a, a very deep sense of um, alienation, you know, that people felt here something is happening here that that actually is that is completely contradictory to what we always expected from a cohesive state that organizes society from above. Mm -hmm. So that and and that again in turn is completely unacceptable to the West. So so you're in for a conflict with many layers of uh, yeah, conscious engagement. But ultimately, it's not a, as, as was suggested in the second panel, with due respect, it's not a matter of mis misunderstanding. Or, for instance, that Trump and the United States could now move to an alliance with Putin or with his uh, designated successor against China. That freedom of um, operation no longer exists because forces have been mobilized in Russia mm -hmm. that will not be easily uh, discarded again. And well, we may like them, we may, we may uh, not like them, but, well, we're not in a colonial relationship with that country. He's elected there, and we elect our leaders here, hopefully, for some time. <laughs> right, that capitalism finally managed to beat popular yeah. democracy. And Wolfgang Streck makes this argument, I think, quite cogently in some of his work. But also, I think the leaders of the <laughs> elites in Europe also kind of acknowledge that. So when you listen to Angela Merkel, you know, she would talk about market conformed democracy. Yeah. You know, Wolfgang Schäuble famously said last year uh, after the referendum in Greece that uh, elections do not change anything because there are rules, yeah. right? To what extent do you think we can actually explain much of the current crisis, rise of populism in Europe and so forth? through economics and also sort of transformations within capitalism. I don't know, informationalization of production, liberalization of capital flows. To what extent do you think that provides us a useful perspective and then how to apply it to actually understand much of this discontent that's driving populism, especially of the right-wing kind? Well, you should never forget that um, the idea that there's a separate economics is already a bit... Um, Awkward in the sense that it puts us in a, in a wrong, it gives us a wrong angle on what hap what's happening. Once, once something like capital, you know, self self reproducing wealth, etc., has become a social force that can uh, sustain itself and operates through states, uh, it imposes a discipline on society and on nature, and it does that in the workplace, on on workers, it does that in the reproductive sphere etc. And, and it also spreads a particular way of thinking about society and about, well, about everything really, also about nature. Um, and I think it's against that discipline, that when that discipline become, becomes too restrictive and uh, too much uh, in yeah, contradiction to, uh, to the, yeah, the, the autonomous impulses of people's lives, you know, there, there's some, there are, there's a very profound friction between the reproduction of capital, uh, especially once it moves through the speculative financial sphere, and the rhythms of daily life, you know, the, the, the rhythm of uh, children growing up, uh, people waking up, sleeping, all these things, and all the, the rhythms of nature, like what it takes, uh, the time it takes to grow something, and just think of uh, that it took millions of years to get uh, coal deposits and oil deposits, and we're uh, exhausting them in a uh, hundred years. So these, these uh, tensions uh, build up almost like a tectonic tension in a, in a situation leading up to an earthquake. And I, I think, uh, yeah, without uh, being overly dramatic, we, we are in that earthquake. Things are beginning to move and that's not because of some heroic uh, working class which behind red banners is now moving to take over power, but simply because people uh, feel exhausted by a society that's leading nowhere. You know, austerity is not just an abstraction. It means that in my neighborhood, uh, the old people's home has been closed, and all the shops around it, you know, the physiotherapists, etc., have also closed. So the old people now have to go to the supermarket to get a free cup of coffee, and that that is a sort of thing that angers them very profoundly in in a totally non-political way. When then some uh, drummer uh, steps forward, type Trump, type 
um, builders in the Netherlands, who says that, uh, well, the, foreign, the coming of foreigners is uh, all the cause of this and so on and so forth, there will be a temporary surge of uh, adhesion for those people. So in that sense, it's not so that the people have made a calculation that the, the economy is no longer acceptable or that they want a different economy. It's simply so that the discipline of capital now reaches into society and into nature to such an extent that people feel constrained by it in a way which they, in most cases, will not be able to explain, but leads to deep disaffection with everything that tells them at the same time uh, things are going great. You know, in our newspapers it's said that, uh, well, it's a bit of a shaky economy still, but it's recovering. Well, it isn't recovering, it will never recover under the current circumstances. And that, uh, people are not stupid. Um, they, they always intuit, even if they are not educated, they intuitively will feel that something is going profoundly wrong. And that is, I, I think, what's happening in our age. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <coughs> unfortunately, of course, there are no forces that are radical enough or, and loud enough to translate that anger into something progressive and humanistic, etc. Especially in the north of Europe, it is uh, um, yeah, demo demagogy and uh, well, everything from racism to prejudice, anti-foreign. Mm -hmm. If you just think, uh, in my native Holland, we were always praised for our tolerance, which was not entirely justified because uh, in the Dutch uh, freedom struggle in the 17th century, there was actually a proposal to kill all the Catholics after the Protestants won. But then the government was advised of the seven provinces that that would be too expensive. And that's a mm -hmm. typical Dutch uh, attitude still today that uh, we, we don't want to throw the foreigners out because that's too expensive. Um, but still that tolerant uh, country now sees scenes that if you have an asylum center where, where people from abroad uh, are, are uh, put up, uh, dead pigs, for instance, are, are hung up on trees. Now that is something I had never expected to see. Uh, that's a sort of medieval scene. And these are the normal people that you would meet in the bus. And, uh, mm -hmm. and <coughs> I think it should be a warning to those who still believe that it's business as usual, that we simply can go on the way we do. Like for instance, in Holland we have our equivalent of the uh, Syriza Podemos type of party. It's called the Socialist Party. It's, it's not the mainstream lib uh, Labour Party, but it used to be more to the left. Uh, but they too are most interested in getting into the government, so they're soft paddling everything that might upset people in their view. And they are forfeiting the role of mobilizing the anger of people, which is why the, that is left completely to the far right. For the next elections, we, know on, we not only have Wilders now, but three more far right parties with almost exactly the same uh, program. Mm -hmm. So we, we might be seeing a uh, landslide in the next general election in mm -hmm. March. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're only a small country, but uh, some very ugly things might, mm -hmm. might begin to happen. Mm -hmm. They will also be short-lived because mm -hmm. people will very soon find that these uh, right-wingers mm -hmm. have nothing to offer. Sure. So two last questions. At rise of Trump, at Brexit, they basically say that the model of neoliberal capitalism that has driven the world economy from that chair probably onwards is over now, that we're entering some other age, post-neoliberalism, however you want to yeah. define it, that will work differently. I'm curious what you think about that. And the second question here has to do with the left itself, which traditionally has occupied a rather globalist, internationalist perspective. When you look at the question of Europe, the left has traditionally rallied behind Europe. So now we see it in the Diem movement that you know, Yanis Varoufakis leads. We see it in the rhetoric of even social democrats like Jürgen Habermas, but also people like Tony Negri. A lot of kind of intellectual uh, brain power on the left is still very much internationalist and pro-European Union and pro-Eurozone. On the other hand, it looks like they are being outmaneuvered by extreme right-wing, yeah. which uh, adopted a lot of their rhetoric 
and uh, never showed any love for Europe. So I'm curious to what extent uh, you think the left can continue behind this pro-European stance and to what extent, uh, you know, in an ironic kind of manner, uh, the rise of Trump and this supposed end of neoliberalism kind of did complete the project that the European left has been pushing on for, you know, 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Well, first of all, I must say that uh, uh, Europe was never a, a left-wing uh, project, not at all. It was, it was part of the post-war compromise culture, mm -hmm. compromise between capital and labor, uh, and also compromise between France and West Germany. That, that is the core of, of, the, um, uh, well, of the interpretation of uh, European integration uh, that prevailed at the time, and uh, the mainstream left simply was in favor of European integration because they generally were in favor of compromise. The, the, the large Christian Demo democratic parties, large social democratic parties were themselves the vehicles of class compromise, not the representatives of one class, but the representatives of where these classes come together. And in that sense, uh, completing that project by also having a Western bloc, by the way, in a Cold War context against communism and the East, um, uh, was was fairly logical, so in that sense, the, there was there was always a, a tolerance of uh, the European integration project, and that has now eroded to the point where there is opposition to it because the, after ninety one, the European Union has made itself the vehicle of the most radical uh, neoliberal policies, policies that in no single, and maybe with the exception of Britain, but that in no single European country would be possible to push through. And they can be pushed through because national governments say, yes, yeah, European regulations and we have to agree. So, um, in that sense, the left, uh, to the extent it exists, you know, it, it's, it's always a, a, a recurrent attempt to build something uh, of resistance. And the resistance is there, but it has now been politically capitalized on by far-right leaders, which doesn't mean, and, and that is really an important point, which doesn't mean that the people who follow these leaders are themselves rightists. I, I think the, the attitude that I see with some people that they say we, don't, we won't talk to the leaders because they are written off as, as right-wing demagogues or fascists, but we should talk to the followers because the followers have uh, opinions that contain many elements of very uh, yeah, acceptable defense. of uh, People want social protection. And that social protection today has to be uh, promised with a credible economic background. So you have to explain what sort of economy we need to get proper health care, uh, return to education. I mean, we can take in uh, migrants, that's not a problem, but not in austerity conditions. If we take in migrants, we also must have an intensified education program to teach people the language of the land, uh, to socialize them in, in the, well, in the cumulative class compromises that have shaped a particular national character. And that's not happening now. So I live in a neighborhood in Amsterdam where uh, the Dutch, Dutch is a minority language now. Uh, most of the people who live there are Turks and Moroccans and they don't uh, bother anyone except the bothering thing is that they're not part of any uh, community uh, except their own. So they set themselves off ever more sharply and with every generation more, very remarkably, because you would expect that the first comers would have the greatest difficulty becoming acquainted with a new room, but it's the young ones who, who are uh, in opposition. And that has to do with the decline of education. So the school that they get is so minimal that uh, there's no chance for them to mm -hmm. counterbalance the satellite TV that they get at home from straight from Turkey or, or Morocco. These, these are explosive, explosive phenomena that get an, ex, uh, an almost explosive response and to which the left completely failed because internationalism would mean that I would feel a particular affection for instance for our foreign uh, fellow men and that's simply not the case because we're where would that love be based on? You know, it's, it's indifference that rules. And uh, indifference can easily slip into animosity 
if, if something unpleasant happens, and etc. Especially if you realize that the lowest level of the labor market is, of course, pity crime. You can imagine that if people from abroad step in the lowest level of the labor market, we will see a few of them as pity criminals. And that very quickly builds up in a sense of resentment, uh, mm -hmm. generally. And that is exactly what is capitalized on by Trump, the oldest, the Brexit people, etc. Because the left uh, is silent on these matters, out of a sort of abstract love of humanity, uh, which is meaningless. You have to be an internationalist, but, uh, well, as Gramsci said in the 1930s, internationalism begins at home. You first have to, um, you know, make your uh, case for a political change in your own country. And by doing that effectively, you are actually making the greatest contribution to internationalism that you can imagine. Because your country then becomes part of the examples of how it can be done differently. If you're just uh, doing nothing at home, but always complaining about what's happening everywhere else, you're, you're getting nowhere. And I'm, I'm uh, well, Negri is a different uh, matter. Negri, in my view, was a provocateur who was rightly locked up after the strategy of tension in Italy because he played a double role as an, as an American agent. Interesting. All right. Thank you very much.